Welcome back to another episode of Raising the Standard. I am excited to let you know that this is part two to our interview with best-selling author, Frank Viola. Now, if you missed part one, you're gonna wanna go back and check that out. In part one of the interview, there were just so many gems. You're gonna wanna go back and check it out, but we talk about the current trends in Christianity, entrepreneurship, everything from being productive and maximizing your productivity as a kingdom-driven man, to understanding your mission and dealing with different themes that you're gonna face as you step out to follow the call of God on your life. Now, I'm really excited to bring you part two, and I gotta tell you, this interview is real and it's raw. You're gonna hear Frank share some really powerful thoughts that I believe you need to hear around validation and reassurance. You know, that's when we seek others' approval for the work we're doing, or we wait because we need someone to tell us it's good enough, or our message is worthy, and you need to hear Frank's take on this. I believe it's gonna set you free. If you struggle with doubt after you step out, Frank's insight is gonna be incredibly valuable for you. We're also gonna talk about how to receive criticism and how to receive compliments. Guys, there's so much in this episode and we are gonna wrap up the episode talking about the fastest way to get your message out into the world. So whether you're an author, you're a blogger, you're a podcaster, or you feel you're carrying a message right now that you have not released, stay with this episode until the end because Frank has a pathway that's gonna help you launch if you wanna step forward with your message. Okay, there's so much quality content to get into in part two, let's get right into it. Excellent, Frank. That was that was really well said. And it just says, you know, step out. What I get from that is step out through fear and release your voice with the message that God gave you and and your unique voice print. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Move despite the fear. Um, and, you know, I hope we can talk about failure, too, at some point, because this is very much related uh, to what we're talking about right now. Yeah, well, let's go for it. I was going to ask you about reassurance and, and what's that look like in your own life. So I'll let you take it where you want to go um, and expound on that for us. Uh, well, let me let me see. You got failure and reassurance. I guess we could uh, break that up into a couple of parts. I'll start with reassurance. You know, I have learned that reassurance is futile. <laughs> seeking it is futile. It's a race to the bottom. Uh, and it's also overrated. Uh, as I said before, you know, I very rarely, if ever, let anyone listen to my um, podcast episodes before they go live. I, I, in fact, I can't even remember ever doing that except for the one I'm going to release tomorrow. And the reason why I did it, I did it for one reason. I got such a kick out of it. <laughs> I wanted to see what the reaction would be. So the question is, Frank, are you going to do that again in the future? Will you let someone listen? Or did you learn, hey, I'm not going to do that ever again? No, it doesn't matter. It, 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 it doesn't matter one way or the other. You know, It just was interesting to me. I mean, one of the people w was my wife, okay? And I got such a kick out of it. I wanted her to hear it, to see her response. And then another was a good friend of mine. And I guess I was, I was enjoying it. I enjoyed the podcast episode so much, especially the spoof part, Josh, that I just wanted somebody else to share the joy. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, you know, when the one person <laughs> did not respond to it at all favorably, it didn't bother me at all. That's going to happen too. I'm going to have people to say, this was the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And others are going to think it's absolutely beyond brilliant. So, well, we're going to drive traffic to it because now I got to drop the link below because we're all going to want to know, like, what was this episode? Okay, that sounds good. Hey, let me talk about reassurance. This is important. I think that reassurance, as I said, it's futile. It's overrated. What reassurance conveys is everything is okay. What you have done is okay. And you are okay. And that, Josh, reassurance is a bottomless pit. You will never get enough of it. All right. So 
let's say I put this podcast episode out into the world tomorrow, which I plan to do, God willing. Some people may pat me on the back, give me high fives. All right. And I may be reassured, but guess what? I'll need it again for the next podcast episode. I'll need it again for the next book. I'll need it again for the next article. And so it never ends. And therefore, my work is not dependent on reassurance. I mean, it's always nice to receive compliments. It's always nice to hear that, you know, your work, something you put out into the world has uh, positively affected somebody, like what you said in the beginning of this episode, so kindly and graciously. But I don't need it. I don't depend on it. And something else I'll say to those of you who are listening, there is a very short delay between the compliment and the criticism. To put it in the words of Kipling, if you can receive compliments and criticism and treat those two imposters the same, then you'll be a man, my son. Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah, it is. And there's a, there's a story in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas go into a city and they perform a miracle and the people are wowed and they start worshiping them and they're bringing out sacrifices and five minutes later, after some people who were detractors of the apostles came into that town and trashed Paul and Barnabas, those same people who are going to worship, bow down to Paul and Barnabas, pick up stones in their hands, and they are ready to kill those two men, Paul and Barnabas. So I have observed this throughout my whole life. Um, you cannot put your trust in any kind of external validation reassurance is something that again it's futile to seek you'll never get enough of it and there's also <laughs> a, a pause in many cases not all between the compliment and the criticism people will love you up to the point where you offend them or you say something to them that bothers them that's when they're ready to pick up stones and trash you and this is this is the world we live in and it's, it's even bled into the christian world so that's what I have to say about uh, reassurance. You want me to riff on failure? I can do that. I, I do, but I have one question first. When we talk about reassurance, I, I really identify with the word validation, like someone needs validation on their message. How does that change, Frank, when you're in a mentor-mentee relationship or you're coaching someone or someone's developing for ministry or developing as a creator where they need some validation from their coach or can we say even a spiritual father? What's that process look like? Because I believe those are two different things you're discussing, right? So I'm curious from a spiritual fathering point of view, what does reassurance or validation look like there? And then what's the difference as you launch out with your own message? Well, let me just say this. <clears throat> if you have a mentoring relationship with a mentor, I still believe it is a mistake to uh, posture yourself where you need right, their validation. Because let me tell you something. First of all, every mentor, every mentor, even the best, is flawed in some way. And secondly, it takes a rare person, Josh, not to become a Saul in the life of a David. And by that, I mean, there are many men who are extremely gifted <clears throat> and they, um, God has used them, but they have some insecurity that has never gone to the cross. And when they confront a person who they may be in a mentoring relationship with, who is just as gifted or more than they are, it takes a rare person who will not turn into a Saul. And become <clears throat> and become a mad, javeling throwing king <laughs> who wants to destroy uh, the David. And so, if you are someone who needs their validation, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be crushed. You know, it's going to be game over for your ministry. So, while you may appreciate the validation, right? To need it, to have to have it, to move forward is a huge mistake in my view. Now, what you do want to be uh, is open to the feedback of your mentor, right? If you do have a mentor, and I, I 
I am all for, and I believe strongly in mentor mentee relationships. I've had several mentors throughout my life. Um, and, and so, you know, the principle is, is scriptural. Um, you know, Jesus trained 12, Paul trained workers in Ephesus, um, you, you know, and Timothy being one of them, Titus being another, and there were several others, actually, there were, there were nine altogether, eight, eight main ones and a ninth. But the point being is that if you have to have that validation, you are skating on invisible ice <laughs> and you're going to ba basically sabotage yourself. Your only validation, your main validation must come from the Lord. You must get it from him. You cannot rely on the validation of others. That doesn't mean you ignore other people. That doesn't mean you don't listen to criticism. That doesn't mean you're not open to create a uh, correction, but it ultimately has to come from your God. Because if it doesn't, then you are destroyed even before you begin. Frank, that was incredibly powerful. And I'm sure that what you just stated right there is liberating someone that needs to hear it as they listen to this, because that's just, that happens. And, and I appreciate that Saul David example there. Powerful. Can I, can I add uh, one point here? And this is related to reassurance. Um, it has to do with being ready. Um, whenever I go to minister somewhere, my off often asks me, <laughs> she'll say, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready to deliver these eight messages in this conference? And my response is always the same. And I say, honey, I'm never ready, but I'm prepared. And what that means is that to be ready means to be sure. You're sure of the outcome, but that's an impossibility. Um, I cannot control the outcome, but I can be prepared. And the rest of it is on the Lord's shoulders. Um, so I, I have learned to be outcome independent. You know, I prepare, ruthlessly prepare. Um, you know, Paul said to Timothy, be prepared in season and out. First Timothy 4.2. I care enough to prepare and put my passion and vision into words that can be easily comprehended, whether that's in a book, a blog post, a spoken message, a podcast episode, but I'm never ready because ready is impossible. It means you're sure of the outcome. And so to, to be able to prepare as much as you can and then trust the Lord for the outcome is the way to go because then you're, you're basically free. You're free to share what you have on your heart because you're outcome independent. And that's hugely important for anybody who is, this, who is in this business of ministry or being a creator. And I hope it helps uh, some of the listeners. Oh, yeah. That, that was awesome. I love that breakdown. And I love your terminology there, being outcome independent. And I, that really aligns with what you shared earlier. And the way you create kingdom impact is you put it out there and then you leave the results with the Lord. It's like one plants, one waters, and the results are ultimately with what the Lord wants to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. You quoted a passage I was thinking about. So you took it right from my mind. That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, take us into failure. How do you deal with that? All right. So failure, uh, Bruce Lee said famously, in great attempts, it is glorious to fail. And Babe Ruth said, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. And that's for <laughs> one of the men who had the uh, all-time home run record uh, until it was broken. Um, but basically, I, I will say this, the person who fails the most usually wins. And let me decode that. It's alleged that Thomas Edison made 1,000 unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. At least that's what I've heard and read. And a, a reporter once asked him, he said, Thomas, how did you feel to fail 1,000 times? How did that feel? And he replied and said, I did not fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an, inven was an invention with 1,000 steps. So the point being is that the person who fails the most usually wins because as long as you're failing, you're still in the game. And eventually you s will succeed, eventually. All right, so for example, um, my father-in-law just got a pool table. 
uh, it's uh, the measurements are prof professional size, so it's larger <laughs> than the average pool table. And so every time I go visit him, I play pool with him. And the guy is better than me, okay? I will admit it. He's better than me. <laughs> and he beats me all the time, and it's frustrating. So I keep failing, but you know what? We played so much that I finally beat him. And so if you're failing, if you continue to stay in the game, you will eventually win. Now, there is only one exception to that, and that's if the failure is so big that you're permanently ejected out of the game. Uh, for example, you commit murder <laughs> in a heat of rage. You, know, you kill somebody. Well, now you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison, so the game is over. But unless it's – yeah, most failures are not fatal, right? Um, but when you fail, you keep playing. And you learn from your failures, and your failures become life lessons. And those who lose are afraid to fail, right? Those who lose the game, th they do so because they're afraid to fail. And so they quit because they don't want to fail. And in the Christian life, for those of you listening who are uh, followers of Jesus Christ, God uses failure to birth humility in us. And humility is one of the greatest ingredients to receiving God's power and his blessing. The Lord humbles the proud, he exalts the humble. This is both in the Old and New Testament. So in the Christian life, failure is sacred. That was amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Frank. I think that's a, a great reframe for how we see our failure. And it makes me look right now like, where where have I failed and where can I use more humility or what's the Lord doing? So I think the... I think the internal prism we should look at this with for every man listening is to take that coaching approach and coach yourself and say, okay, where am I in God's process right now? What's he doing in my life? Where's his hand on my life? What's he shaping? What's he forming? And how and where am I being conformed into his image? So that was powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Well, absolutely. Well, Frank, let's um let's let's pivot here to the people that listen that have a message, which I believe everyone has a message. You know, one thing I say on the show a lot is that every man has a mountain and it's a place where you can exert and exhibit your influence. And for some of us, that's with a spoken word or a written word. But for those that have a unique message or they have a message that they feel called to release to the world, how does someone start if they're at the beginning of that process? Okay, I, I'm going to answer this as truthfully as I can. And I have no other motivation but to help people um, with this question because if I was just starting out, I would want someone to be straight with me about it, okay? Um, you have got to invest. You have, it, it, it's <clears throat> profoundly important that you invest in being trained by people who have experience and have been down the road before and have experienced both failure and success in getting their message out, okay? <clears throat> now, this is hugely important because it not only will save you time, which is a limited commodity, but it will also spare you a lot of heartache, a lot of failure, a lot of you know, laps around the wilderness that are unnecessary. Uh, and the problem today is you've got a lot of people, um, especially if you watch YouTube and you see the ads pop up <laughs> or you're on Facebook and you pay attention to the sponsored ads, you've got a lot of people claiming that they're going to help you, right? Um, get your message out. Or if you're starting a business, they're going to help you make a huge impact. And of course, it's usually a, a promise of making a lot of money. This is how I did it, blah, blah, blah. And in most of those cases, and I'll just use the author space, right? If you're an author and you want to write a book, I have checked out some of these people who pop up on YouTube or uh, Facebook ads. I don't even know who they are. And they claim they're going to teach you how to write your book and how to make money off of it and how to publish it and all this kind of stuff. I've looked at those people and I've done a little investigation. Virtually none of those people, actually, I would say in every case, none of those people are published by a credible author, or excuse me, are published by a credible publishing house. None of them. Number two, most of them self-published their book, and usually it's an book, one book, right? 
Um, and then in other cases, you look at the Amazon scoring and and so forth. They, they're not selling, you know, one million five hundred thousand uh, is the ranking. Okay, and and yet, Josh, for reasons I'll never understand, people are spending lots of money to get into their programs. Why are they doing that? These are amateurs. These are hobbyists. In many cases, they're scam artists. They have no credibility. They can't show you, hey, I've written, you know, X number of best-selling books. You know, I am published by X number of legitimate, high-quality, credible publishing houses. And yet they're trying to teach people to do these things, and they're charging a lot of money to do it. So here's what I would say invest in training by people who have actually done it, whatever it is you're looking for. You know, if you're looking for, like, for example, you're somebody who I respect, especially in the, uh, in the space of um, exercise, right? Um, and I've gotten some advice from you on that subject, uh, personal. Um, so you're excellent at that. And so consequently, I would say, find out about the people who you are wanting to learn from and look at their track record and see if they actually have been successful and what they're seeking to train you to do. And so I would say if they have a message, I would recommend highly that they invest in the Scribe online training, uh, which you're a part of. Uh, you took it yourself, uh, Josh. Yep. And because I know of nothing that will help a person from A to Izzard, you know, um, it gets into blogging and how to start a blog. It gets into uh, the power of podcasts and how to do that. It, it gets into how to build an audience. It gets into how to monetize a blog and especially how to write a book um, in a short space of time, how to get it published how to promote it, which is the hard part, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all come out of firsthand experience. So that's what I would say to them. Invest in that. There's no way that I could explain all of that, you know, uh, in a podcast episode. We'd be here for five hours <laughs> just to start, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but we'll, we're going to talk about the scribe um, training uh, later on, I think. So I can talk more about what's in it and uh, why people should invest in it. But it really, it really comes down to, in answer to your question, you've got to invest – and training from people who know what they're doing and have, have proven it. Uh, because without that, you're going to be spinning your wheels. You're going to be frustrated. You're, you're going to fail uh, without, without doubt in a way that will probably discourage you from continuing to play the game. All right, Frank, I really, I really loved how you talked about finding a mentor and a coach. You know, I'm a coach. I've been a coach in multiple different areas of my life from corporate to, you know, you mentioned fitness and now I'm leading a group of men and we're going deeper in our spiritual, personal, professional development. So Frank, what I loved about what you summarized there was that a coach takes you from point A to point B and they can help you bypass the pain. They can speed up the journey. And there's also something required of you because whenever we follow someone, we must make an investment. I would even say this, and I would like to take you here for a minute. Wouldn't you say that the first century disciples made an investment to follow Jesus? Oh my goodness. An investment that can't be calculated. I mean, for most of them, it was their life and sometimes physically, all right? So to be a Christian in the first century, you were baptized. That was no empty ritual. You were basically dying to your entire life. You were dying to the systems of this world. And you were giving your allegiance to someone who was not embraced by the world, uh, someone whom the world hated and put to death, by the way. And so many of the Christians... Um, were also equally put to death because of their faith. And, um, but even those who weren't, their entire life was given over to, in every aspect, um, Jesus of Nazareth. And so, you know, investment is kind of a mild way of putting it. You know, it was total radical allegiance. And, um, you know, <laughs> The answer to your, your question is yes, uh, underscored and put in bold. You know, I had a theologian on the on the show a few episodes back, and one of the statements he made was, you know, following Jesus is free, but it's not cheap. 
And I think you just underscored that there. And I'm using that to say, whenever we make a commitment from the highest commitment we, we can make to follow the Lord to even minor commitments, we pay attention where we invest. And you can invest multiple ways with your time, with your money, with your attention. Right now, you're investing in this podcast if you're listening to learn and to develop yourself as we have this conversation. So when it comes to coaching, I firmly believe, Frank, and I agree with you, and I've invested a lot of money um, over the course of my life in terms of time, but also dollars to get a new skill, to fast forward time, or to get me from point A to point B quicker and avoid the pain at the same time. And I believe when we talk about Scribe and what you put together here, that's what it in fact does for people. You're actually mentoring people that are looking for someone that's been there to take them through the process, show them the steps of how to release their work as a content creator, um, get it published, or even if they want to go the self-published route, do that as well. But most of all, get it heard so ultimately they can make an impact. So Frank, I want to tell you, I mean, we were talking right before we started the podcast too. I've been using, so I'm, I'm a member of Scribe. I purchased Scribe from you. Um, I made an investment in myself to, to learn different ways, strategies, tools, tactics of how I could take my book, The Standard, and get it out to the next level. And I'm really excited because I started putting some of those things into place right away. And I can tell you that in the last month, generally, if I rewind the clock a couple months ago, I think my website traffic was somewhere in the 10 to 15,000 range. It's like 10 to 15,000 visitors a month were coming to standard59.com. And now, because I've used specific strategies that I used from Scribe, I just got a report just last week that showed me my website traffic was up to 40,000 visitors from last month, 30,000 in the US, just under 30,000, and the rest from around the world, which is pretty crazy to me. Yep, yep, that's it, yep. So what you what you have here is really impactful because I've seen the fruit of it with what I'm doing right now and getting my message out around the standard, discovering Jesus as the standard for masculinity. So why don't you take us, for those specifically that are thinking about writing a book, maybe they've started it, maybe they believe they have a message, whether they're at the beginning of the journey, maybe you're one of the people like that falls in the, st the statistics of, hey, I started this, but like we talked about earlier, I just haven't finished it yet. And then maybe you're at the end of the, pro the process where you're just about done or you're getting ready, but you're not sure, okay, I haven't finished, but now what do I do? How does Scribe help them? And if you could introduce us to really what is in Scribe, I think that would be great for people that are listening that want to learn more about this program. Yeah. And even for those of you who have already authored books like yourself, you already had your book out when you took the Scribe training. It is for them also because it gives you uh, steps, very practical steps that have been proven to work um, on how to take that book to the next level and also how to make your next book most people are not one-time authors, uh, even beyond, right, where the first book went. Um, so basically, this is the origin of it, and, and this is what's in it. In 2008, my books started to get international acclaim. And since that time, I have received countless emails and letters asking me dozens of questions about how do you write a book? What's your process? How do you get it published? What about self-publishing? Because you've published some self-published books, people would say. How do you do that? What about editing? What about promotion? I can't, I've written a book. I can't get anybody beyond my family to buy it. Um, and so what I did is I took all these questions over the years, going back to 2008, and I held a three-day intensive event. It was a live event. And Josh, I loaded both barrels and I fired away until I had nothing left. And I also, I had a female New York Times bestselling author who presented with me. And we shared everything we know about publishing, writing, <clears throat> writing, editing, promotion, everything from A to Izzard that I learned and discovered since I began writing books. And uh, someone said, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. The next best time is today. Your most valuable asset, my most valuable asset is our time. It's our time. And what Scribe does is it collapses time. 
by giving people a step-by-step -step proven process. See, that live event was videotaped. And so we recorded it and we make the entire event, the whole training online, and then we added a bunch of other stuff to it, resources like Prolific, the course I talked about earlier in the uh, interview, my creativity, productivity, mission finding, goal setting hacks, uh, how I'm as productive as I've been able to be, all of that is in Prolific. Well, that's one of the bonuses that people get when they sign up for Scribe. The Buzz Seminar is another uh, seminar that we recorded. That's all about blogging, how to start a blog, build an audience, how to monetize a blog even. And, you know, Josh, when we uh, held the Buzz Seminar, which is, again, part of Scribe, you get it as a bonus. It's all audio. You listen to it. And um, everything is there for you, the tools, etc. When we started it, blogging was very popular. Today, a lot of the bloggers who were top tiered bloggers 10 years ago, even five years ago, they've stopped. That means the space has opened up. Best time to start a blog is now, is now. And if you want to be a writer and author of a book, that's one of the secret sauces. And I explain it in the Scribe training. So anyway, 90% of those who have taken Scribe, the training, the online training, have written or published a book within 12 months. And a number of them have gotten their books publicly, or excuse me, professionally published. Um, it gives you a step-by-step -step process that's proven, all right? You know, I already mentioned in the beginning um, that I have written over 30, well, actually a total of 34 books, last count, uh, 15 professionally published by top-tiered publishers, nine of them bestsellers, uh, and uh, beyond that, all of my books together have sold 600,000 copies plus. These are just the professionally published books, right? So, so I'm only saying that to communicate that this is not theory, <laughs> all right? It's not like the Facebook ads and the YouTube ads that you see by publisher by uh, authors who are unknown. They've never professionally published a book. They may have written one or two that they self-published, and they're wanting to charge you an arm and a leg to train you. No, this all comes out of experience. And um, there is a link in the show notes, and I'm saying this because it's important. Scribe only opens up once a year. And when it opens, it's only open for two or three weeks. And once you get it, you have it for life. You could take it at your own pace. I mean, once you have it, you have access to it at all times, right? Um, you can go through it anytime you want. Uh, hit pause, go come back to it. But um, because we're on this special interview uh, in this podcast, we have opened it up via a special link. And so if they use the link... Um, in your show notes, when this goes live, they can get it uh, right after they hear this uh, this interview, right? Because we're going to keep that link open. So that's a real blessing for people. I just have to say, uh, I know all of what's out there in the author training space, and um, there's nothing like Scribe. Uh, and this has been attested to by many other people who have taken it and have taken other courses and have even been part of masterminds for authors and so forth. And again, it's for any aspiring author and any accomplished author. Uh, they will receive uh, real practical help. And that's the key word there. It's practical. And it all comes out of hard won experience. You know, none of it is theoretical. Yeah. Well, you're totally aligned with your message. That's the way you preach. It's the way you write your books. It's what you shared earlier. So it only makes sense that this is something you can deliver because you lived it in terms of all the things, all the components. You know, what I love about Scribe, Frank, is that I think when I got it, I binged like for a day straight. I went through everything. It might've been over the course of a few days. I took it all in. I took some notes, but then I found myself going back to the parts I needed and the workbooks were great. And, you know, you talked about blogging and I started implementing that strategy when it was the right time for me. I didn't do it immediately, but when I did, that's immediately when I started seeing results. It just started happening month after month. And I believe that's definitely one of the strategies for why we're reaching, you know, right around 40K visitors a month on Standard 59. So 
what I love is all the resources and the tools, because I think with other programs, it's like you learn how to write or you learn how to self-publish. But with this, it was like multiple courses in one for different steps in the journey. And I could go back and I still go back. I actually use the the resources still when I want to implement something different. Yeah, no, that's, that's how a lot of people use it, Josh. And uh, that's wonderful testimony. And also when people uh, get the scribe online training, they're also invited into a closed Facebook group. And so they have access to me and the other presenters. They can ask questions. There's over a hundred people in the group and people often will post questions and other, other authors will answer them as well. So it's, it's, um, it's something I feel very good about. I'm very glad I put it out there and everyone who's taken it has just raved about it. The testimonials on the, on the actual scribe page, I think speak for itself. So amazing. Well, thank you so much, Frank, for opening that up for us. And if you're listening to this, you really are unique because I had to wait until it opened up and I've seen it and I watched it as it opens up just a few times a year. So take advantage of that. If that's something you're interested in, or you have a message and you feel like you need the next step, you need the community, you need the guided expertise to help you launch that message. I full heartedly endorse scribe. I believe it will help you do that. Um, as someone starts to step forward, Frank, in taking this journey, as they start to put their work out there, as you've put in your work out there, how do you deal with criticism? Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, because if you are doing work that makes a difference, you will, not might, <laughs> not maybe, you will get criticized. You're going you're gonna to catch it. Um, the nail that stands above the others always gets hammered down by some people. But all criticism is not the same, and this is a key thing to understand. In fact, you can tattoo it under your eyelids. All criticism is not the same. Now, in my most recent book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, I explore three kinds of critics. They are the supporters, the objectors, and the trolls. And each critic is different and ought to be treated differently. Uh, someone once said, don't take criticism from people you'd never go to for advice. Uh, I'll run that by again. Don't take criticism from people you'd never go to for advice. Now, I largely agree with that. For me, the criticism that comes from supporters is priceless. These are people who are in your corner. They love what you do. Uh, they may say, hey, in this article or book, there's a typo or a misspelled word, or this article is really great, but it would be better if you used this example, or you cited this story, or you used this biblical text, or even if they say, hey, you missed something in this article, why don't you add this point, it would be even better. And I find that kind of criticism absolutely precious. Um, but most of the kinds of criticism <laughs> that you will get, um, you would do best to ignore because it's not constructive. And unless a person is enrolled, enrolled in the journey that you're on, right? There, there are people who read your work or listen to your work and they get the joke, so to speak. Um, it's really not valuable to listen to their criticism in most cases. Now, I'll say something else too for the Christians who are listening. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, criticism will test your spiritual maturity. Watchman Nee said, nothing so tests the spirituality of a teacher as opposition to his teaching. So if you have produced a high quality work and some people give it a bad review, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if it's high quality work and it's really touched some people and you know, ministered to, to others, the person that gives it a bad review, all it means, it wasn't, it, it means it wasn't for them. That's it. It wasn't for them. Um, and so that's what I would say about criticism. And, you know, people who are afraid of criticism, and this is typically the biggest stumbling block that creators have uh, that prevents them from launching their work is the fear that they're going to get criticized. And you're going to have to dance with that fear and find a way to push through despite it because you will never uh, help anyone 
if you allow that fear to paralyze you. And, and really, Josh, in my view, it's a selfish act to uh, succumb to such fear because you're depriving people of being helped by that which has helped you. So, for example, um, and this is a this is a related point. Most people who have been impacted by what you have said or written will never tell you. They will never tell you. And uh, this became very apparent to me. There was a, a conference that I spoke in once, and there was a woman who attended. She was a young woman, and she gave me a card. It was a sealed card. And she said, um, because I'm meeting you in person, I wanted to give you this card. And she's not someone who uses email or, you know, uses Facebook messages. So this was her opportunity to tell me something. And um, when I brought the card upstairs to uh, our room, my wife and I opened it up. We read it. And basically she said, your book from eternity to here saved me from suicide. I was going to kill myself. All right. Now, here's my point. My point is this. I would have never known if I had never showed up to that conference and if she never attended. This was years after she read the book. Years. And so my point is, is that most people are not going to tell you if what you have done, right, has impacted them. And the other uh, thing I will uh, say is that, you know, not only is uh, not all criticism the same, but if your fear of criticism prevents you from putting out your work, you are being selfish because you're depriving people of what you have to offer. If I said, I'm not going to write from eternity to here, or maybe I've written most of it, but I'm not going to release it because I'm afraid of being criticized, that woman may not be alive today. So it's selfish to succumb to fear in putting out your work. That's amazing. You know, Frank, um, it's really powerful. And I think it's a call to responsibility for what are you carrying and what are you, then you're responsible to release it. And for me, this, this is what happened to me. I'm just going to inject my personal testimony in this. Um, back in 2016, um, I was spending some time with the Lord, just my morning time. And I felt the Lord speak to me very strongly that he was looking for an ROI in my life a return on investment. And I said, okay, like, Lord, what's that mean? And I didn't have a platform. I didn't have any opportunities open to me, but I felt that I was from that moment to start preparing and, pre and putting preparation for the time when the opportunity shows up. And it was at that time I started writing and I just started journaling. I never, actually my story of writing a book never started out to say, hey, I'm going to sit down and write a book. It turned into just journaling with the Lord and just seeing things in scripture and taking note. And over time, I realized that was a book that I was supposed to release. But I did start leading Bible studies. I was collecting my notes. I started putting things in order and curating my content because I understand that when preparation meets opportunity, it will put you into your destiny. But you must be prepared when the opportunity comes. And so I was preparing back then. And now I can see that's a responsibility the Lord laid on me. Start getting things ready. I've made an investment in you. I'm expecting a return on that. And I would say for all of our listeners, we all have investments that have been made into us by the Lord, but they come in different ways through relationships, through the knowledge, through the mentorship, through the coaching you receive, through the teaching you sat under. And then that forms your unique message, your unique spiritual fingerprint that you're called to leave on the world. And I think that we need to have coaches and guides and mentors to help us push us forward to release those messages that we're carrying. And that's our responsibility. Yes, absolutely. That's well put, my brother. That's well put. Okay. So Frank, you have written over 30 books. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I've read most of them. I've not, I think I've read all of them. So out of all the books you've written, which are your five favorites? I know that you have ones that you say, this one's really important. I also know you're working on a new one right now because I can tell by the way you spoke through this interview, it's bleeding out a little bit. I know you got something upcoming. I'm wondering if you can just drop us a little bit of a hint of what's coming up next that you're working on. But I'll start first with the 30 books that you've written. What would be your top favorites? Yeah. Well, let me first say that it is a Himalayan task to write a book. 
So for myself, uh, I write a book when I have no other choice. Um, meaning I write a book if the idea is powerful enough and it warrants that it gets under people's skin and grabs them by the throat and makes a change. Um, but when it comes to making an impact, um, there's nothing that compares to a book. There just isn't. And so that's the reason why, you know, I, I'll be willing to uh, put the blood, sweat and tears into uh, producing a book. But readers and listeners uh, can see my entire catalog at frankviola.org forward slash books, or they can go to frankviola.org and look at the menu and they can see all of the books. But my top favorite would be, and this is in no particular order, but it would be uh, God's Favorite Place on Earth. That book has been described as poetry in motion. And theologians and scholars have remarked to me at how fresh the message was. They had never seen the point being made uh, in their reading of the Gospels in the New Testament. And I'm not going to give away the point, but <laughs> it's all about God's favorite place on earth and how that applies to us. But to my surprise, Josh, more grown men have cried through that book than anything else I have written. And that's based on so many emails I have received uh, from people who've read it. The next one would be From Eternity to Here. And one very famous author said it reads like a movie on paper. Uh, which I was really blessed by, um, it uncorks God's grand mission, his eternal purpose from Genesis to the genuine leather. So that's a very important book to me because the eternal purpose is the central message that runs throughout all of my work. Um, the other one would be Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. And to my mind, this is the book that's most needed for our time, at least from what I've written. And some regard it as my signature work. Uh, what it does, it explores the explosive gospel of the kingdom throughout the scriptures. Um, there are six parts to it. They all work together. If one part doesn't strike a reader, I tell them, move on to the next part and come back later because they all do something differently. But I think that is the message for our time uh, from my perspective. Uh, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power. At the time of this recording, this is my newest book. Um, it's all about how God's power operates in a person's life, uh, whether they're in ministry or not. Every Christian needs God's power. Every Christian um, has a ministry of some kind. And um, this book explores what depletes God's power in our lives, in our ministries, and what increases it. And uh, the website for that is 48laws, that's spelled out, uh, not spelled out, but written as numbers, 48laws.com. And they can sample the book, and they can also listen to interviews I've done on the content. And then the last one would be Jesus Manifesto. And uh, that is a cure for JDD, Jesus Deficit Disorder, <laughs> uh, which is a virus that has afflicted most of the Christian world today from my perspective. And I have a co-author who wrote some of the chapters with me. So uh, those would be the top five. Those books are incredible. Frank, I got to tell you, and I want to tell the audience too, I've had, I've had spiritual experiences reading your books where I've stopped, I've prayed, I've met with the Lord, just some powerful moments um, based on the themes that you write about, how you unpack them, and just how you use your gift in partnership with the Lord to bring these messages to us. Um, very powerful. I'm going to drop the links for all the books below so people can see your catalog and we'll list your recommendations here as well. But um, I can't thank you enough for the work that you do, how it's personally impacted my life. And I know it will impact the listeners that choose to pick up any of the books you just mentioned, as well as the rest of your catalog. As we wrap this up, Frank, and we bring it in for a landing, um, what are your final words for the guys that are listening? I'll tell you, you know, we have a tribe of kingdom-driven men. These are guys that want to reach their full potential in life, regardless of where they are in the different sectors of society, whether they're in business and being a husband, being the best father they can be, and ultimately bringing the Lord and fulfilling his ultimate purpose in their life. If you could leave us with some parting words for just charging the men as they go forward from here. Um, I would love to hear and give you the mic. Well, I would say um, invest in 
uh, reading and listening to people who are proclaiming the kingdom message. I think it's rarely preached today, and when it is, it basically is kind of diluted or watered down, or it just takes one aspect of the kingdom and ignores the other aspects. Um, you know, Josh, you're aware of this, but I have a podcast called The Insurgents Podcast, and it goes along with the book Insurgents Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. But I have partners in all of the episodes, or virtually all of them, uh, and they're different. Um, one of them was Michael Heiser, who unfortunately passed away. Um, but I have these these guests, and, and I'm not interviewing them. They're actually uh, partnering with me, and we're talking about the uh, kingdom of God together. And uh, right now what we're doing is we're going through every single reference to the kingdom in the New Testament. And we're in the Gospels right now, and then we're going to go to Acts and Epistles and all the way through Revelation. And we're riffing on uh, every mention. But I guess in terms of um, going beyond investing and in listening to people who are talking about the kingdom message, uh, find a mentor. And the way to do that is if they have impacted you personally, approach them, you know, ask them, do you have any mentoring program? Do you do anything in the way of mentoring and reach out? That's how I have found all the mentors that I've had in my life. Um, and so, you know, uh, mentors will collapse time for you. <laughs> uh, they'll, if they're good, and not all of them are, but if they're good, they'll spot things uh, that you won't see. And they could also prevent you from making some mistakes that you'll regret. So those are the two big things I would say, you know, invest in listening to and reading those who emphasize the kingdom message. And, um, and don't just listen to one voice, you know, take, take, take a number of them. You know, you and I mentioned T. Austin Sparks. And um, he was a great influence in my own life. And he really understood the kingdom, the kingdom message. Um, so he, he's, he would be one person I would point to. But uh, check out the Insurgents podcast if you're interested in anything I have said in this podcast interview. And, uh, and find yourself a mentor and just approach them. And don't be offended if they tell you that, you know, they're not able to do it. Don't take that personal. Um, that's not a good sign <laughs> anyway, if you do something like that. So, um, yeah, and let the Lord lead you and guide you, uh, in that endeavor. Frank, that's really awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I've gone, you know, I, in my life, I've gone and, and approached people that I knew they had something that I needed and I went after them and I took them out to lunch if they were local or I bought them something and I started that relationship to get into it. So I can't encourage that enough. I mean, we need fathers, we need mentors, we need coaching and we need to be proactive. Sometimes we sit around and we just think the doors, the doorbell is going to ring and someone's going to show up and they're going to be there to give me all the missing pieces that I've been looking for, but it doesn't work that way, does it? Yeah, no, absolutely not. And I will add one other thing because it, came into my mind uh, as we were talking. If you're listening to this and you're a pastor or a teacher talking about the scriptures, um, God's word and, and, and so forth, um, I have a uh, mentoring um, mastermind, actually. It's both mentoring and it's mastermind called uh, The Insurgents Experience. And it goes along with my book, Insurgents Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. And um, there are different tiers. We have some tiers for older uh, pastors, leaders, and we have some tiers for younger, those who are in their 30s, for example, or early 40s. And if you're interested in this at all, just go to ministrymind.org. That's one word, ministrymind, all one word, mind, M-I-N-D, ministrymind.org. And you can read the testimonials. You can see what we do. And uh, what you want to do is apply. And um, we'll look at the application and we'll decide what the best tier is for you. And you'll get the registration information, which has all the details. But anyway, I just say that because I don't know how many pastors, uh, teachers, et cetera, are listening to this. But that is one 
um, resource you may be interested in. Frank, it's been awesome speaking with you today. Thank you so much for just sharing your wisdom, for offering Scribe to everyone that's listening. We're going to put all of Frank's links below. We're going to put the link to Scribe if you're getting ready to write your book or you already have it written and you're ready to launch it and see some traction and get some results. All those links will be below. Frank, I just want to thank you again so much for coming on. And until the next episode, let's raise the standard. Hey guys, my name is Josh Kachadorian. I'm the author of the book, The Standard, Discovering Jesus as the Standard for Masculinity. And I just put together a brand new challenge for you, the ambitious Christian man. If you're in business, if you want to reach your full capacity, if you want to unlock your potential, I need to tell you there is an unfair advantage that is available to all Christian men, but not all access it. That's why I put together this free 11-day email challenge. Click the link below, sign up for the challenge, and you will get equipped with the knowledge, the resources, and everything you need to take your promised land and learn how to partner with your unfair advantage. Can't wait to see you in the challenge.